Bhagavad Gita, text 2.56 Amid suffering and happiness, his mind is neither deluded nor delighted. He who is free from desire and whose passion, fear and anger have subsided is said to be a sage of steady mind. Here, suffering, dukeshu, refers to the three miseries, adhyatmika, miseries arisen from one's own body or mind, adibautika, miseries arising from others, and adidevika, miseries from natural disturbances. The jnanis experience of both sorrow and happiness are a result of his parapta karma. In the case of the unalloyed devotee, however, it is due to God's special arrangement. According to the Padma Purana, karma appears in various stages of development. Karma, acquired over lifetimes, is stored in an unmanifest stage known as Abhra-Rapta Karma. When this stock of karmic reactions begin to manifest, it is called Kuta. From the stage of Kuta, karma develops into a seed-like stage known as Bija. This seed stage of karma appears as one's predisposition and desire. When the seed stage of karma blossoms and actually manifests in our life, this is called Prarapta karma. Once this karma has blossomed, it must bear its fruit. Although karma in its earlier stages of development can be destroyed by spiritual practice, one's parapta karma must play itself out. One who has attained knowledge of the self witnesses the expiration of his parapta karma, remaining unattached in the midst of the happiness and distress that it brings about. In this verse, we learn that the parapta karma experiences of sorrow and happiness continue from the realized soul. However, we also learn that the realized soul is not overwhelmed by delusion arising from sorrow that produces lamentation, nor is he overwhelmed by a sense of delight arising from happiness, causing him to hanker for its recurrence. Both the experience of sorrow and happiness alone are the result of parapta karma not the indulgence in lamentation and hankering that unenlightened souls are involved with. This indulgence on the part of the unenlightened is what perpetuates their karmic involvement. It is their unenlightened response to their parapta karma. Because the realized soul is merely witnessing the expiration of his parapta karma, he does not indulge in lamentation and hankering and further implicate himself in the karmic circle. His ability to forego such indulgence is not a mental adjustment, but a result of his realized knowledge of the true position of the self. The devotee's status with regard to parapta karma is slightly different from that of the self-realized jnani. Bhakti has the power to change one's parapta karma in this life. Footnote 11, CBRS 1.1.70-26 It uproots the foundation of ignorance that underlies all karma, but it also places one under the charge of God for the purpose of doing his bidding in this world. The unalloyed devotee is not concerned with liberation. His concern lies only in God's service. 
having destroyed his karma in the order of Aprarapta, Kutta and Bija, God arranges for him to remain in this world as long as he sees fit, be it for the remainder of this life or for several lives. He does so by preserving his devotees, Prarapta Karma, and infusing him with divine Shakti. When God desires to take his devotee from the world, no longer able to bear the pain of separation from him, he distributes his devotee's pious Prarapta Karma to those who love him, and any impious Prarapta Karma those who oppose him. This is the opinion of Baladeva Vidyabhushana, as explained in his Vedanta Sutra commentary 4.1.15-18. Baladeva Vidyabhushana's remarks are in keeping with the sutras. They do not, however, stress the efficacy of bhakti in removing parapta karma, as other Acharyas' comments have. Baladeva speaks more of the power of knowledge born of bhakti than he does the power of bhakti itself. The Gaudiya position on the bodily status of a devotee is stated by Sri Chaitanya himself thus, A devotee's body should never be thought of as material. It is transcendental and made of spiritual substance. At the time of initiation, when the devotee offers himself to God, God makes the devotee equal to himself. He makes the devotee's body spiritual, like his own, so that the devotee can engage in the service of his lotus feet. Chaitanya Charitamrita Antya 4.191-193 Speaking of the spiritual nature of the devotee's body, Sanatana Goswami recounts Shiva's explanation to Narada in Priyat Bhagavatamrita 1.3.60-61. Therein, Shiva speaks of his own experience, stating that he feels no necessity of citing scriptural evidence in support of his opinion. Shiva says, that owing to their drinking the nectar of devotion to Krishna, devotees' bodies become transformed into something spiritual. Just as when drinking certain potions, one's body becomes transformed. The scriptural example of Dhruva Maharaja is noteworthy. In the Bhagavatam it is described how Dhruva left the material world and entered the spiritual abode of Vishnu in his self-made body. Vishwanath Chakravarti comments that this pastime of Dhruva was revealed by God just to stress the spiritual position of the devotee's body. Although this is not the norm, we should nevertheless learn to appreciate that even the bodies of practicing devotees take on a spiritual quality in proportion to their absorption in devotional practice. The practitioner's body is thus both material and spiritual at the same time, and eventually it is completely spiritualized. It's apparent death, a divine illusion. As such, the form of the departed devotee who has attained Brahma is itself an eternal object of veneration. Other than the devotee, no one, not the jnani, yogi or any other transcendentalist's body, is completely free from material qualities. This is the opinion of Vishwanath Chakravarti who supports his position with Krishna's words to Uddhava in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.25.26. Therein, Krishna tells Uddhava that one who has taken shelter of him in devotion 
is free from all material qualities. Nirguno mad apashraya ha. Footnote 12. See his commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam 10.29.10.